I wouldn't call myself a professor, I was, an, uh, I was interested in uh, do-it-yourself technologies and I was interested in the environmental stuff and um, I was a teacher at the university. I wasn't a professor or anything else, I was a um, senior lecturer in architecture at Sydney University and also I taught at New South Wales, so I had, I had a capacity to bring a lot of troops in.
We were still undecided, I think, and so we kept on mm. going round and going round. And, uh, aimlessly. <laughs> aimlessly, except one day we, we, we started going down this little road which led into this valley. We, very beautiful valley, and which revealed this interesting small town. And we'd heard about the Nimbin Rocks. They were very spiritually uh, important to the Aboriginal people of that area. And there were lots of rumours about the Nimbin Rocks, that people could hear things happening in them, and, and had this sort of, um, you know, interesting vibe about it and we came around the corner past the Nimbin rocks and the four of us saw this looked like a western and deserted western town and four people said yes <laughs> well in fact i remember you colin saying as we were driving off i really think we can recycle this place <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure right, recycle was the appropriate no, word if you yeah, think about it. It was it an N-word then. <laughs> it was certainly an N-word then. At the end of the festival itself, when it was closing down, we had a meeting called After Nimbin Wat. And a lot of people came to that meeting, obviously inspired by a rural lifestyle or, you know, they liked the idea of growing things and uh, uh, <clears throat> they didn't want to go back to university in particular. And, um, but that, uh, Terry McGee was one of the key people in that, that movement because he set about setting up a commune and several other people did. And uh, even before that happened, we were going around putting options on various property, or and um, uh, I think a number of places were bought in the main street of Nimbin. Where some students were getting credit, was that your class? <laughs> yeah, it was, but the credit was pretty wafty. <laughs> they were doing it because they were getting kicks out of it. <clears throat> I mean, I did. Uh, gather some of them and we built an autonomous house when we got back to Sydney and uh, they got credit for it. But this was a holiday and it was a festival and, uh, and you'll learn a lot from it. story of the redevelopment of Woolloomooloo, an inner city working class area of Sydney, and how the residents, both of the Woolloomooloo Basin and of Victoria Street on the cliff above, with the help of the Builders Labourers Federation, the BLF, and the Federated Engine Drivers and Farmers Association, the FEDFA, fought an attempt by politicians and developers to rebuild the area as commercial high rise. The remnants of this community have had a long, hard battle. They have been helped to put their case in professional planning terms by a community advocate. Let's hear your views and opinions. I think great advantages have been made out of Victoria Street and the Green Bands and Woolloomooloo that the dialogue is starting. And new planning legislation being before the government now and it's very much orientated towards community participation because the planners know that they, they made a lot of errors by not talking to people. <laughs>
20,000 vacant properties in Sydney now. now, which is appalling when you think of there's about uh, over 100,000 people on the waiting list for public housing, there's people, kids sleeping in the streets, we did a survey at the university, there are students who are working 30.31.4 hours a week and supposedly doing a full-time education. So it's affecting, uh, you know, they, they squat because it's the only way they can survive. The saying I like is, and I thought squatting was a yoga position. <laughs>